I have a question to both Susan and to Zora. Uh, in the description of uh, uh, reservoir uh, computing, uh, there was this cut between a reservoir and the last stage. And my question is motivated uh, by the fact that uh, I am a faculty at Tonghu University, Sendai, uh, which has a reputation of being number one in material science. And there's a lot of work done uh, in uh, developing smart materials. Uh, but the smart materials typically require quantum description. And this, uh, when I look at this division where we have decoding, I understand that decoding will involve measurement of observation, which in quantum case uh, uh, starts to be a problem. Now, it is part of uh, processing. Uh, so uh, my question is basically, how you see uh, this, uh, it is not about quantum computing because basically the smart materials uh, are like uh, computing in traditional way, but how this will influence if we want to consider uh, materials where quantum description is uh, important. Okay, I'm not sure um, whether you're saying that the problem is the fact that you have to observe them and they've got a quantum description. Because I understand um, and, and that therefore that will change the material mm -hmm. back when you observe it. Um, or whether, because uh, you, you kind of said the quantum description is just the way it's described, but they're com potentially computing classically. So it depends whether the observation changes the material in a way that changes the computation that's being done. But given that it's a black box, and you would be observing it in a particular way all the time. Um, my guess would be, uh, and I haven't actually thought about it beyond, beyond this, my guess would be that would all get folded back into the dynamics of the system and you'd still be able to, to use that. Um, um, they, because, because it's a black box and your observations are the, are, are the same all the time, they're not contingent on any state of the system, then you would be having the same effect all the time and then that would just get folded back into the learning algorithm. That would be my guess. I might be completely wrong, but that, that's my guess. Yeah, I can see the problem because uh, when we have this black box we, uh, and it uh, behaves in quantum way means uh, there is a state of coherency, we cannot observe it. That yeah, yes, and so when of, you yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when so you do here, observe it, it will have an effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I but I don't think so that effect will will be an effect, but I think that will just get folded into the black box weird behavior of whatever's inside. Um, um, because I think, I, as I understand it, the only time when um, there's a problem is when the observation that you make depends on, say, the previous observation that you made. So like with measurement-based quantum computing, um, where the measurement that you make depends on previous state and therefore has a, is kind of almost doing the computation for you. But with Actually, reservoir computing, the measurement you make does not depend on the previous states. It's always the same. Yeah. Actually, here is the, the other way around. Yeah, that uh, the fact of measurement is changing the state of uh, of, uh, of the system back. Yeah. So there, there yeah, is yeah, this yeah, kind of yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, but but it's always the same kind of measurement. So it's changing the state not in a computational way, just in a, an observational way, which can be hidden inside the algorithm, I believe, but, um, but I'm not entirely convinced because as soon as you bring quantum into it, it gets non. Um, uh, Martin, I have, a, I, have a, I, have a, I have a very concrete question uh, to understand your question before I reply. Uh -huh. So this is, we are talking classic alignment standard quantum mechanics, right? You have a wave yeah. function evolution and yeah. then you measure and you, co you collapse it, right? Yeah. Right. So this is the way, this is the way systems should be used, yes? Yeah, so uh, what I mean is that at the last stage when we are doing decoding, yeah, we are influencing back what was uh, uh, what system was doing. Uh, basically, we are separating 
one particular state because measurement will, will change uh, the system. So if we don't measure, there is different outcome. If we measure, there is different outcome. Okay, so basically you are you are you are propagating the system, and then you do measurement. You have some collapse of a wave function, so wave function changes, and then it continues to evolve. You measure again, you have a collapse of a wave function. Wave function changes, and you go on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have studied we have studied feedback loops. You know, we have studied feedback loops uh, that we were adding by hand to increase the intelligence of the system because that's that's like. A, knowledge, common knowledge about reservoir computing, that the feedback loops are essentially the ones that where the intelligence resides. Okay, so you can, even there have been attempts, attempts people try to construct the system when you have an extremely simple dynamical system, but by adding feedback loops to it, you actually, you increase in intelligence tremendously. Like you, you are adding virtual nodes to the system. So now what you're doing might be extremely, it might be blessing and a curse, right? But it, it could be because you're adding these feedback loops and they might, add additional intelligence to the system. So I don't think this is necessarily bad. I think this is rather opportunity than a problem. Yeah, I mean, okay. one just has to be careful, right? What, what, I think, uh, what I think happens here is that uh, you should go away from the standard reservoir computing dogma and you should not, you should refrain from just looking at the last state of the system. You basically have to look at the whole sequence of events like this barcode stuff I was talking about. Thank that you. would be my guess. So I'd say I, I'd say it's an opportunity. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, at the moment, I don't see any other hand. So I will um, make a comment which can be interpreted as a question uh, uh, about <clears throat> the talk on the self. I'm afraid I've forgotten who presented it, but I've never had a self. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I had one. And uh, I use the word self quite a lot. I've hurt myself. I embarrassed myself. I made a fool of myself. I uh, saw myself in the mirror. Uh, but in all those cases, the thing I'm referring to is me, not a part of me, a special part, which is the self. And I think the, the word self just happens to be a useful quirk of language which somehow some people mistake as referring to a part of an individual, whereas it always refers to the whole individual. And there's nothing else there for it to refer to in all the examples I just gave, but maybe there's something about myself that I've not noticed. I, I, I think the self here is in a very restrictive sense in the sense that uh, what Damasio is talking about is your body has to maintain its uh, homeostasis uh, parameters within a small range and that equilibrium maintaining, knowing that equilibrium and maintaining that equilibrium is extremely important. Otherwise you will die. So essentially that part is what is called, uh, you know, really the self in, in terms of uh, how it is representing its own body, how bodily functions are functioning and how the liver is, uh, you know, communicating with uh, other stuff and making sure all the stability is there. So you have a representation of yourself and then you are using that self as another uh, reference frame in order when you are interacting. So for example, when you are holding a cup, you know where your body is and uh, what your body's uh, fr frame, frame of reference is and how that is related to the actual motion. And so you have to actually carry those parameters. So you, it's not about uh, you know, a theoretical self, it is a physical self and the physical structure and that structure has a position and it has a, a behavior and it has a relationship with the other entities and that is the knowledge structure. So you have to have entities, you have to have relationships and you have to have behaviors. And these behaviors change locally by just mere communication. That's what Turing said in, in one of his uh, papers, which is uh, probably was not published for a long time because his boss was, uh, thinking that it was a high school boy's essay. And uh, in that paper, he talks about how you can actually change the behavior by mere communication. That means that the local body component or whatever it knows, like for example, your heart doesn't talk to your, uh, you know, uh, uh, understand everything that your liver does, but all it uh, gives a signal saying my blood pressure is going up and it might reduce sugar, right? And that knowledge is inside the liver 
and the knowledge that uh, blood pressure, it has to send a signal, that knowledge is in the heart. And so this is how entities and relationships and behaviors are modeled. And that models the self and its relationship with the outside. Um, and that's very important when I'm talking about, uh, you know, whether my application components, because as I said, distributed yeah. components acting as one single cell. So if the single cell divides it into multiple components and executes only that portion that is relevant in that particular uh, distributed location. And therefore you essentially get replication and then, uh, you know, an uh, active uh, partition in the local uh, uh, cell and so on and so forth. So you can essentially model uh, your, uh, uh, you know, IT components just like uh, cells. Well, I think in every case, what's being modeled is something that we can refer to. And it's not a special bit, which is a thing called a self, which keeps changing every time you model something different. Yeah, I, but anyway, no, let's, no, no, no. there's now it, somebody it, it, else. No, no, you, yeah. your parts may, you know, you can change your parts, your molecules to, to go and, you know, get transferred, but your whole self identity is still there, right? And the whole autopoiesis definition is that you maintain your total identity, even if the components uh, com come and go. So that is essential requirement for auto scaling, for example. When I take my application as a whole, as a network of components, I might delete some components over there, but I might uh, create some other components over in another place. I am still, my application is a whole, right? And so even if you yeah. lose a part, the self doesn't uh, disappear. The identity is important. Okay, well, um, I can say all of that without assuming that there's a special thing that's a self. It's all body parts and states. There's someone else with a hand up. Oh, Gordana is now. Uh, and, ah, oh, yes, Gordana, I think, was next. You need to unmute yourself. Oh, I, I think I have a question for Jordi. So can we change the topic? This is about okay. embodiment, and Jordi proposes how can we get embodiment into robotic or, or abstract systems by uh, giving uh, some robots possibility to, co to communicate directly with sensors and everything, and then getting information into the system for the rest of the world. Is it so? Have I got it uh, right, Jordi? Yeah, yeah, and that, that the idea is interesting. I think that even people from who started to make research on cloud robotics try to do that. The problem is that the transfer transferability of the learning, because it's it's uh, not only because of the platform, because but because of the the sensory motor learning about the properties of an object, for example, and the categories necessary for interpreting the object. For example, the visual patterns. That's how 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 to escalate between different. Uh, quality ranges uh, or things like that. It's something that, for example, when I uh, grasp something, I don't need to tell uh, to my kids that, of course, I have this height, and then you need to take the, use this height, and, and then you need to make some calculations. They observe me, and they know that if I grasp something here, they will have to grasp here because they are not as tall as me. So it's it looks like a stupid, but it's not so so uh, easy in this sense because if uh, this kind of uh, cognitive performance tasks are uh, grounded, uh, generated, different grounding uh, systems uh, need different kind of uh, adjustments. And this is the, the point for uh, intercommunication between different platforms. And at the same time for, for uh, uh, like a, a evolutionary a unique platform, a one platform that can be a change according to a new kind of uh, things. Yeah. The idea is uh, it's to connect an, acti an activist and grounded cognition to this kind of modular robotics. The modular robotics is, is already there, but from a very different perspective. So this is the, the point. Uh, if we had make advances in this kind of uh, research, this kind of challenges that we are facing too. I connect it to, to the previous question of uh, feeling of being there or feeling of being myself. So if you if you just take information from the world by one robot who is sensing and send it as information to the rest of the world, it will not be this feeling of myself because 
at the moment at that place with your body you are you you get this feeling of being there and being self and just transforming information will not map to another body to another self as, as long as you have uh, your representation is common in terms of the entities and relationships and behaviors then essentially the connections make it into a global knowledge network and so essentially the identity comes from the super uh, layer of the network and sub networks have their own identities so it is like uh, just a, a human network organization that's how social networks work that's how the body network works and that's how consciousness you know uh, any physical structures all physical structures essentially can be grouped into identities and you know higher hierarchy of identities right and so essentially computation is about information and knowledge whereas uh, your uh, <clears throat> consciousness is about knowledge and consciousness and then you have uh, social networks where you have uh, consciousness and a global uh, you know super consciousness right and so you are having a hierarchical identities and at each level of identity it knows how to manage the downstream and that is what the you know general theory of information from Mark Bergen says. And uh, it essentially, I think a lot of people have not read those books. And so they really don't grasp this uh, powerful concept of uh, structures and the role of structures and the role of knowledge structures and how to represent knowledge. And that I think is the major uh, you know, uh, breakthrough here. And that is what makes you go from Turing machines to structural machines. You cannot do autopoiesis and uh, cognitive layers with the Turing machines, no way, because he has proven mathematically. So the reason why you need to go to from Turing machines to the uh, uh, structural machines, you need to go from data structures to knowledge structures where the behavior, which is originally in the program in the form of APIs, now is going into the knowledge itself and therefore, the operations that are on the knowledge schema are connections between the nodes and the networks. So as, you, as soon as you connect it to another uh, node, the node, what that node does is only communication is the information that will make the behavior change in local, right? And so your common knowledge representation is a graph, no longer a data structure. You don't need the APIs. I don't need to know all the program APIs to create a composed object. And that is the major breakthrough with uh, Mark Bergen's uh, structural machines. And uh, I don't think a lot of people re read that books because it is a lot of mathematics and it took me a couple of years actually to understand and apply. So it's uh, unfortunate because most classical computer scientists don't understand this. And I think science of information processing structures is totally a breakthrough science from like the uh, special theory of relativity with respect to Newtonian physics and uh, uh, statistical mechanics from thermodynamics and so on. And I think that's what Stanis, uh, you know, Stanislas uh, Duhaini is also mentioning that you need a theory like that, which goes beyond the current AI and a half-brained AI and also uh, current limitations of the church during thesis. Well, um, Zoran's been waiting for some time. I think maybe it's uh, you can have your turn now. Okay, Unmute okay, yourself. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, thanks. So my, my question is is a layman question. Okay, I basically these meetings we have together have raised this 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 curiosity. And I start, I'm starting thinking more and more about consciousness and, uh, and uh, awareness and uh, cognition and what does it all mean. But as a layman, it's sort of hard to, to make up my mind. So this, this question is, is directed to philosophers, right, who, who actually are thinking about the, these problems. So do you, do you see consciousness, cognition? I apologize, I'm not probably, they, they probably should be dis distinguished, they're not the same thing, but you know, in my layman mind, they are, they are sort of one, I put them in one box. So are they, are they emerging phenomena or are they something that are, that are functional? Let me explain, right? So in a way, every organism solves certain problems, right? So it's designed to compute functions. This is, this is very simple way of, of, of viewing, uh, viewing organisms. 
And uh, so do you, do you see consciousness as just one of the functions that actually organism implements or, or is it something emergent that is above that, beyond that or outside of that? And how to think well, about it, how to begin thinking about it, right? As a philosopher, I've been thinking about this for many years and writing a lot about it, but I'll just say briefly that in my experience, many of the people who think about it focus on particular aspects and forget about everything else, whereas there's a huge variety. For example, have you ever been chased by an angry bull when you're in a field? Well, perhaps not, but if I suggest that while you're being chased, uh, we can ask, what, what are you conscious of? Well, it might be a whole lot of different things in different ways. One is where the bull is and roughly in how fast it's approaching you. Another is you're looking for gaps in the, in the boundary of the fence, or if there are no gaps, uh, something that may be low enough for you to jump over or climb over. Um, but you may also be aware of uh, being very exhausted and, and wondering whether you're going to be able to keep running to get there before the bull catches you. Uh, but there are also a whole lot of other things going on that you're not aware of at all. Uh, the control of movements of body parts requires information about what those parts are doing. So one could argue that there's all kinds of levels of consciousness operating in parallel, without which the process of escaping would not be possible. But that's totally different from a mathematician sitting at a desk and thinking, there's something wrong with my proof. Uh, I haven't quite got to the point that I wanted to where I can draw the conclusion I want, but I'm, sh but I'm sure I'm close to it. Is, can I find something, what I've already got, that, which has significance that I haven't noticed, and then go back and try to derive an extra bit that will enable me to close the gap and so on. Those are two totally different situations. And if you think about human life and life of many other animals, you'll find many different situations in which what we can think of as consciousness is very different and involves different products of biological evolution, different parts of our physiology, different parts of our brains. And uh, most people who write about consciousness try to focus on some very specific and very limited subset of that without realizing what they leave out. That's my private personal prejudice. Um, before we leave that topic, perhaps someone else might want to um, may, may I say to say something? Uh, yeah. may, I some, may I say something about this? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah hello. Um, yeah, there, also for the layman, there is a model that I, I looked for some time that comes from the Indian philosophy. And I think that in, in the Western world, we, we have this cultural bias towards our, our own schools. Um, we are not very aware of other models that are very old and in which the consciousness is something emerging. For instance, Aaron, you, you said in English, the self is a word that we use for this, for that. So there is no self separated from the self, blah, 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 et cetera. In, 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 in Sanskrit, in the, in, in the Vedic languages, you have this difference. There, is this, there, are, there are different, different layers of the self. And there is a whole system that, that is based on, on physical phenomenon, which is called the Samkhya. I will share one slide only super fast. Uh, in which you have this, which is a little basic, but there is a, def a definition of the body that defines the physical body which is called the Anamaya Kosha, is that like, like wraps around ourselves, And we have the, the material, we have the physical or energetic, and we have the mental, then we have the knowledge and intelligence towards, towards the soul. This is exactly what Rao explained before. He mentioned the physical model, the, um, the, uh, another model that was energetic also, then the communication, then the mental, etc. And here, there is the, the inside, inside very close to the soul. Of course, this is a religious belief. It's not, it's not only philosophy. It's also religious. But towards the soul, there is the bliss, which I like to connect with purpose. And in this, I think it connects with also this cross embodied knowledge, etc. The purpose for for this methodology of thought, it's something 
that it's already there from a superior instance. And then the emergence, the emergence of the consciousness on the individual consciousness eventually meets that and knows if it's good or bad. So you have the joy and peace or you have unhappiness, etc. So that's a philosophical uh, idea. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that is actually consistent. He's actually consistent because there is really 4E yes. cognition, right? And so the 4E cognition has its own subconscious, right? And so at every level, you have a certain level of conscience, uh, consciousness yeah. because if you are uh, actually an embodied uh, or embedded uh, cognitive layer and you, have, you are doing something, you have now a downstream where lots of things are happening and you have to manage your downstream. And at that point, yourself is essentially at that sub layer and therefore it's a hierarchy. And so as soon as you get yeah. to be a human, then you have multiple humans who are becoming a society. So as soon as you become a society, there is a collective consciousness. And you are, mm -hmm. in fact, our language, our mathematics, all that came from collective consciousness. It didn't come from uh, internal consciousness. I did not you know, discover everything by myself. It is actually passed <laughs> on and so on and so forth. So yeah. it's really, there are five Cs, computing, communication, cognition, conscience, and culture, exactly. and culture yes. is the higher level, right? And so this is the- I, I call it purpose. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. the culture. Yeah. But then in, in, in line with this, with Jordi's presentation about the transfer knowledge, I think that it's in this, in this area between the, the mental, the, this here is yellow and, and green, between the mental and the knowledge, no? the, 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 the seeing and the knowing, this is where, where is this exchange, which I will also make a question to Jordi and, and, and I will shut up, is that... Uh, Perhaps if, uh, uh, release the screen first and then... Yeah, sorry, yeah. If, yeah sure. Unshare, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. then, then we can see sorry. people's faces. Yeah. For share, yeah. Sorry. I think I stopped. Is that okay? Or not. No, no, no. So, so may I may, may I comment briefly? Uh, so, yes. so my my gut feeling for what has been said essentially it is the, uh, the, the there there right. is a modular yes. organization of uh, of a thought right and I think I've seen article on on how engineering systems are organized people have tried to actually figure it out uh, you know regardless of the system what are the generic features of engineering systems and they're all modular. So for example, if you look, if you look at the living cell, it's modular. Even we humans, we engineer modular systems, but they occur spontaneously in nature. It's it's modularity. So if you knock out one part, you know, the system still works because there might be another module taking over. And it's easy to control, it's more stable. And uh, you know, my gut feeling is that what has been said so far is that the, the consciousness uh, is related to the source of information on one hand side, and what sorts of information do you actually react to? Because you can have a layers of information that are interacting with each other, right? And they can produce new information. And then the question is, where do you where do you hook in onto all this scale of, of, of processes going on, right? Is my understanding correct? Absolutely correct. Actually, it is a hierarchical, right? So essentially yeah. you have composability. Composability is the key there. Yeah, I, I would like to propose itself. that we are uh, using this system that uh, you raise your hand before you start talking. <laughs> okay, and, and remove your hand when you've had your turn. Um, yes, I think uh, I'll make one comment about this, that uh, some of you were at a meeting yesterday where Mike Levin and I talked, and f we uh, both paid a lot of attention to biological evolution and the variety of chemical states and structures and processes, for instance, in the production of, an, of a chicken going through an egg, and one could extend that to other uh, animals. And um, the, the kinds of uh, uh, traditional theorizing that many cultures teach, which have some value, are often uh, based on complete ignorance of 
the products of biological evolution or nearly complete ignorance. And if we really want to understand these things, then I think we have to look much more closely at biology and we may get both some surprises and some shocks about what we've not noticed. But that's a personal view, which um, I should not uh, enlarge on while I'm supposed to be cheering. Uh, the only hand that's up now is Jordi. Would you like to go? Unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. I, I just stopped the video. Just for uh, references, of course, uh, as a philosopher, uh, the problem of consciousness, as Aaron said, it, I think it's the most important, one of the most important philosophical problems for any philosopher uh, of, of any field of either continental analytical, even analytical ones for language, uh, it, it's it's the biggest one, it's the hard, hardest problem. So no, no easy solution. From my humble perspective, I think there are two different things. For me, it must be, it's of, of course, if you are not a believer into some supernatural force uh, acting into the body, it's a bodily process. So it's a neuro neurochemical process uh, that it, it must work without the symbolic uh, uh, tools. It works without that, but with thanks to symbolic tools, we take uh, into account the some uh, upper level of uh, self-consciousness. But it's different. One thing is the the functional property of the neurochemical uh, tools for the uh, functional functional properties of this mechanism. That it's not uh, still not clear how it works and and how manages different levels of information decision. This is one thing. It must be physical and must be has must have some uh, very specific natural uh, rules for the function of the consciousness. This is uh, still unknown. On the other side, is the feeling of myself of being. This is another thing. For that reason, for example, my research is so connected with emotional research, with co cognition and emotion, because emotions give the feeling of the experience. And it's, it's, it's related with consciousness, but it's not the same. That you can have a feeling of something and not have consciousness from a high informational level, like uh, consciousness of pain for a dog, but the impossibility of the dog of thinking about uh, itself. So I, I know it's complex, but I, I just wanted to say that this is a, a very physiological aspect of consciousness that of course must be a, a, an emergent property of, of nature. I don't, I don't think that it's a, a very special way of processing data. I think it's, it's a, like a very uh, a hard uh, problem, like uh, say the original author. And at the same time, uh, coming back just at the beginning of the, of the debates, uh, there is a huge difference between uh, 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 Western and Asian uh, experts on the study of, my, of the self and of the consciousness. But the, the, the nice thing is that neurochemical uh, studies and neurology studies, contemporary studies, are approaching more to uh, Asian uh, perspectives of uh, the idea of the self as something not stable. It's something that changes constantly. There's not the, the real existence of myself. Myself is something that it's constantly changing from a bodily uh, 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 perspective at neurochemical process and uh, at a bodily level. So it, the, the myself is like something like a shadow. It's not not, not real. The, the real thing is the, the embodiment that allows this kind of, of process. So just, just on a point uh, to, to these ideas. Okay. Well, there are two hands up. By the way, I've never had a self and I've never missed it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think um, Guillermo may have been the next one, and then yeah. Marcin. Yes, uh, also it's connected to Jordi because um, in, this, in, 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 in this attempt to in this attempt to to exchange information, which is a matter a little bit of semantics, but it, but that goes beyond that. Uh, I'm thinking between two robots that have to exchange, for instance, information about an object, and there is the quantitative, like the weight. That has very clear semantic. You say this is 25 kilos, and the other understands immediately. Uh, then maybe you can say, oh, this is heavy or light. And then there is there's a grounded truth there that may probably can also be interpreted by the other by knowing about the, the morphology and the characteristic. But maybe there are other things, like for instance, you can say, oh, this is difficult to handle, which is completely subjective. So mm -hmm. I see there are several layers. And then in this hierarchy of, of knowledge about the other that allows you to reinterpret 
what you got from that ground to your ground. Um, where are the limits in, in complexity? Because we cannot, as, as a system, uh, like a cloud system or cloud robotics, we cannot have a local representation of everybody's ground. So what is the next step? Is like some meta semantics or meta is, how can this be tackled? Yeah, I think that is a really important uh, problem, but that, that even not, not talking about different morphologies, but think, for example, about the problems of, of males in this planet for understanding the, the, the females' uh, problems in our planet. For example, it's, it, there are plenty of uh, behavioral studies that show that uh, unless you can embody uh, a female structure into, for example, in, in a virtual space, you cannot understand what are feeling females in a normal society because there are plenty of things that are hidden. There are plenty of things that are not just explained. The science is the way of, of, of talking to you. And for example, there's a, a classic experiment that just sharing online without body appearance, your interactions just uh, using a female name or a male name. You are treated completely different. So even for uh, systems like humans who are sharing the same grounding uh, structure and the same grounding cognitive uh, uh, functioning uh, uh, tools, uh, it's very difficult to, to get the, the picture unless you put into the place of the other side. Uh, for that reason, there are even some artistic performances and, and at this, this time also psychological experiments trying to uh, make fake embodiments, place yourself into the position of another one, then try to understand how that, peop that person is feeling. For example, most of people that don't, uh, in, in Japan very recently uh, uh, forced some politicians to use some kind of, of artificial worms to, to feel how a woman, a pregnant woman is, is being, uh, feeling the, the world uh, uh, when they are trying to do things. Then you get the, the uh, why they are asking for more permissions or for more uh, facilities because just having an extra weight of uh, 20 uh, kilograms around your, uh, your belly change completely the experience of the world. Yeah. So even for humans, it's very difficult to understand the other because we share apparently, but there is a huge uh, symbolic structure that makes it difficult to agree about things. Yeah. In that in that uh, case, the problem is not the grounding uh, structure; it's a symbolic uh, processing on all of things, all of all of these things. So the the good uh, point would be to study more uh, the human interaction and then try make that, try to make good translations to the robotic areas. This is the most fun. Thing for me of robotics and of artificial intelligence that place us and for us to think about humans, not about robots, but about humans. This is fascinating for me because each, each time that I talk with an engineer about trying to, to do something and I try to explain some be inspiration uh, mechanism or tool, it happens the same. That, 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 that the biological one, it's so complicated that it's not a direct translation. We're Sorry. running out of time. I think Marcin has been waiting. Uh, I just to... wanted to, to say that uh, because Zoran asked what philosophers think about consciousness. There is very little which you could say all philosophers think about consciousness, this and that. Or anything and so else. This is, yeah, so, so basically uh, there are many different uh, uh, views, many different uh, theories. So uh, you, uh, at some point, you started to uh, make some kind of conclusions about modularity. Uh, there are theories of consciousness which are uh, uh, exactly saying opposite. You know, that, for instance, uh, uh, integration of information uh, model of uh, consciousness. So uh, I would I, I would just warn to make conclusions from uh, some position, which could be very valuable, but uh, there are always some kind of objections. Yeah, so there's no one general uh, answer, what philosophers think about consciousness. And then within uh, this, when we know, I would say that the big issue, which I think here it was not uh, um, articulated, is between objective and subjective. Yeah, we can look for common commonalities of objective uh, views on uh, on um, consciousness, but subjective consciousness is very unlikely. I don't say it's impossible, but I don't believe it will be possible to find 
common uh, sense of consciousness, which would be universal for everyone. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, I think there's uh, something important about that. Uh, and in particular, uh, in my case, I've been thinking for many years about the forms of consciousness involved in mathematical discovery. And it's quite clear that there are very different sorts of mathematicians who think in very different ways. Some are very yeah. much restricted to symbolic, discrete forms of thinking. Others, like me, think much more spatially, like the ancient Egyptians and Greeks who made discoveries in geometry and so on. And then there are others again who uh, come out with uh, theories that none of us would be able to understand without learning for about six months. Anyway, um, there's, Jordi, your hand is still up. I just presume that's just a leftover hand. Uh, or did you want to come back? Okay. Okay. Is, is there anyone who's been waiting patiently and um, uh, perhaps been a bit shy or something uh, who's got a deep thought that you're prepared to share and take a risk well uh how do we proceed now are we running out of time um i can't remember Sorry, what time we would uh, oh, i was yes. waiting may, yeah, may, but... may i share something sure 20 seconds very personal yeah. for me it was a great discovery the first time i attended the uh, the summit in Gothenburg 2017. For me, coming from a technical background, PhD in computer science, etc., this perspective about information, like this, a difference that makes a difference, and embodied and information as interaction, I think these notions are not taught in schools properly. And to me, that was a revolution in my. In, in my research and in my perspective. So that's it. That's a, the, the difference that makes a difference is a reference to, um, uh, now I've forgotten his name. Peyton. Uh, Peyton. Peyton, that's right, yes. I have a paper discussing what he could have meant by that, but that's another story. Um, is there another hand up now? Um, Jordi, was that, oh, that's still left over. Yes, okay, from last time. Um, Right. Uh, what, Gordana, when are we, when are we Gordana, supposed to end now? <laughs> Gordana, uh, I, I'm wondering, Martin, are we ending 20 or when yeah, is the time? Because we, we actually, on the schedule, we have 20 more minutes for the discussion. So we could continue uh, or uh, maybe it would be better idea to, uh, to continue discussion or to start break not to uh, start earlier because maybe someone wanted to come sure. to, uh, to watch uh, or to participate in other sessions. So in, in this case, I think um, we could continue discussion or uh, when discussion will finish, we can make break and then we'll restart at uh, 20. Uh, I, I try to avoid using hours because my hours are different yeah. so it will be uh, UTC uh, 720 past the hour yeah. and the but hour is different for everyone yeah. 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 and Marcin uh, this is very late for me so I'm going to leave I just want yeah. to thank you both and also I just want to conclude that uh, my discussion was more narrowly focused on how to apply this to IT it was not about uh, global consciousness and so on so I personally think that uh, the narrow definition I gave essentially will allow us to do autopoietic uh, information systems and integrate AI and the symbolic computing and provide a higher level of uh, management of uh, lower level. So you can have composable architectures in software, which is a big problem today. We cannot have composable services in, uh, you know, uh, in IT, in, uh, in the software. And so this big problem can be solved if only computer scientists learn about knowledge structures and the structural machines, why the Turing machine is not enough and how you can go from AI to symbolic and sub-symbolic computing to super symbolic computing. It will help the IT and the, our current uh, dilemma with uh, software. That's all. Uh, thank yeah. you very much again. And, I would uh, add chemical computing. 
I would add chemical computing to that. But Zoran, is your hand up now because you yes, want to say I something? Have very, yeah. I have a very short question. Thank you. I, uh, there, is, there is this idea of Turing test, right? That you decide whether, whether you are talking to a machine or, or if you can't decide, then you know that, that it's, it's sort of you have artificial intelligence. Is there such a thing for cognition, such a thought experiment for cognition? How, how would you actually figure out whether, whether something is, has a cognition or not? Well, I doubt that there's any general agreement, but you have raised a point that uh, ha has concerned many people. For instance, there are now people talking about plant consciousness, and some of them will say that uh, the forms of cognition in plants, for instance, one part of a plant signals to another that there's an invasion of insects, and the other part produces a chemical substance that then comes back and uh, sometime later uh, the insects go away because they don't like this chemical. Uh, now is that a form of cognition or consciousness or whatever? Uh, often uh, we have to consider that perhaps our concepts are not rich in general enough and have to be modified in the light of new knowledge and that's one of the things that science does to us. Thank you. Jordi, could, if you okay. don't ask I... for floor, Jordi, can you turn off, like, uh, lower your hand? I must uh, lower you the can... hand. Yes. I can. Now? You... I touch again. Yeah, you, and... you go down oh. to the reactions box and... Now, oh, you've done it. You've... Yes, you've okay, done it. Great. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I thought that uh, right. uh, no, when I started to reply... Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm. And Susan now has uh, something to say, I think. Yeah. Yeah, can I come in to uh, pick up on Zoran's point about um, cognition? Um, I mean, one, it, this isn't cognition, this is computation, but one of the reasons we invented this abstraction representation theory in order to say, when does a physical system compute? It, uh, um, we've then subsequently taken that further to say, and who is it computing for? Um, so there's a representational entity added there. And so we can distinguish two cases of bacterial computation one where the bacterium is computing or information processing for itself because it's its own representational entity as distinct from when we have engineered it to do a computation for us where we are the representational entity and looking at the computation so it's not just um so in that approach we can not only say when a physical system is computing but it's crucial to be able to say who is it computing for and it can be doing it for itself or it can be doing it for a different entity and so but but we're not saying we're not saying what computation is doing or how much computation and i think this um thing about the insistence on turing machines and universality a lot of the computational stuff we're looking at we, we, i don't care if a computation uh, if a computer is universal i just care whether it can compute what i want it to compute um and uh, and so with the bacterium it doesn't need to compute maybe quite as much um, um, but it can compute little bits like how to find food and how to move around and, and so on. Um, and so um, that's, that's why we did that work. You've reminded me that I once heard some people talking about a collection of bacteria which change their state separately, but they signal to one another until they're all ready to take action together, which uh, they can't do on their own, they can't do successfully on their own. Yeah. And that would be yet another example. There they're computing for their colleagues, the other bacteria. <laughs> right. Okay, I think uh, we have reached the end of all the pressures to talk. And uh, I would like on behalf of everybody to thank everybody. And we ourselves can thank ourselves uh, as well as thanking each other's selves.